So scientists have this idea that some exoplanets, which are worlds outside our solar system, might be water worlds. They orbit their distant stars, covered by global oceans. Even better, some experts claim that our Earth was once the same, a vast expanse of the ocean, and just a bit, if any, visible dry land. At the moment, water makes up 71% of Earth's surface. Our planet experiences continuous movement of water. First, water evaporates, rising from the ocean surface to the atmosphere. Then rains fill lakes, rivers, and underwater reservoirs. Eventually, all this water ends up in the ocean again. Water also plays an extremely important role in the processes happening below the ground. For instance, water content in magma determines how explosive a volcano can be. Anyway, one of the most burning questions about Earth's water is, where did it all come from? It's very unlikely that our planet was simply born this way. The thing is, water has a way lower condensation temperature than some other substances, like silicates or iron. These materials compose the terrestrial planets in the solar system. In the early history of our planetary system, the region where Earth formed was too hot for the oceans to condense at the same time as our planet appeared. So, there's this idea that water appeared on Earth when melted meteorites hit the surface of our planets. Well, scientists disagree. Researchers analyzed some melted meteorites that have been hanging around in space since the formation of the solar system about 4.5 billion years ago. They discovered that those space rocks had extremely low water content. Even more surprising, they were among the driest extraterrestrial materials ever found and examined. In other words, once they melted, there was essentially no water left. These results were very important, since they helped scientists rule out melted meteorites as the primary source of water on Earth. Plus, we can say that this revelation was kind of eye-opening. Imagine the unlikely conditions that aligned to make our planet habitable. Getting water and developing surface oceans on a planet so small and so close to the Sun is a great challenge. If Earth had formed just a tiny bit closer to the Sun, our planet would have been much hotter, and all the water would have most likely evaporated. If it had been farther away from our star, Earth would have turned out to be much colder, and the water would have probably frozen into ice. The team of scientists managed to analyze seven melted meteorites that had crashed into Earth. Those must have splintered from at least five space objects known as planetesimals that later collided to form the planets in our solar system. These planetesimals took part in something known as melting. They got heated up as a result of the decay of radioactive elements in the early solar system. This caused them to separate into layers with a core, mantle, and crust. Plus, the heating and melting of planetesimals apparently led to near-total water loss regardless of how much water they started with. As for meteorites, some of the samples arrive from the inner solar system where our planet is located. The conditions here are relatively warm and dry, so it's no wonder the meteorite samples didn't contain much water. But a few samples were from the colder outer reaches of the solar system. That's from where the water is believed to have come to our planet. But if this water hadn't been delivered by meteorites, what kinds of objects could have carried it all the way across our planetary system? There's one more theory, though, that hydrogen inside our planet played an important role in the formation of the oceans. At the same time, these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. Water could have been delivered to Earth by impacts from some space bodies, like asteroids from the outer edges of the asteroid belt, spanning between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And some amount could also appear inside our planet. There's also a theory that claims that Earth gradually grew by accumulating icy planetesimals about 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, it was still only 60-90% to 90 of its current size. According to this theory, Earth managed to retain a certain amount of water in some form throughout the process of accumulating its mass, and as a result of large impact events. It sounds quite plausible. The examination of the chemical composition of lunar samples brought to Earth by the Apollo 15 and 17 missions indicated that water had already been present on our planet before the Moon was formed. So far, all these ideas remain just theories. At the moment, we don't know for sure how water appeared on Earth. 
What we do know is that there are many other space bodies that have water in this or that state on their surface, or under it. Let's start with our dear Moon. On Earth's natural satellite, water can be found all over the surface, but it's probably not the water you imagine. You won't find pools of liquid water there. On the Moon, it's mostly ice. Some places have more water than others. For example, the poles of the Moon are regions that never get any sunlight. That's why they're extremely cold, and there's a lot of ice there. Plus, the ice in these areas is often mixed with the lunar soil and hidden deep below the surface. Then there's Jupiter's moon Europa. Astronomers consider this world to be one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are far different on Europa. Scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water reservoirs on Europa are or how long they need to refreeze. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It's not really large, only 314 miles across. This makes the space body small enough to fit inside Arizona. Wait, we should try that. Eh, never mind. When the Cassini space probe first arrived at Saturn, Astronomers thought that Enceladus was going to be a frozen ball of ice. But then they saw plumes of icy particles and water vapor erupting from geysers on the Moon's surface. It became clear that there was a massive ocean between the Moon's rocky core and its icy shell. If you've been imagining Mars as an extremely dry place, you need to listen to this. Scientists think there could have been a lot of water on Mars in the past. What makes them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that can only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet. It's true that Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface of the planet. But under the surface, it's a different matter you can find water in Mars's polar regions. But the only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere. But it only exists as vapor. Since we know for sure there is liquid water on Mars, could we possibly use this water during the human-operated mission to the Red Planet? If we manage to do it, spaceships coming from Earth wouldn't have to bring their own water. It would make the cargo way, way lighter, which, in turn, would decrease the cost of the mission. We would just need to take enough water to get to the Red Planet and bring along the equipment needed for filtering Martian water to make it drinkable. Well, it sounds simple enough.